So we'll start with uh, some brief introductions just so you guys know who's up here on stage. My name is Jason McClellan. I'm over at Heroku, part of Salesforce. Um, I've been there for about a year and a half. My job is I'm CMO for the Heroku business and I run our online sales organization. So Heroku is kind of interesting. We have a couple million people on the platform and we sell to everything from like individual developers to like monster Fortune 100 companies like Eli Lilly and Johnson & Johnson. And so we have kind of an interesting sales approach that's just grown up over the years is, you know, really figuring out like how do you sell to really small people, then how do you sell to like really mature enterprise companies and how do you make that a seamless process where you can grow with your customer. Um, and so we have a lot that we're happy to share. And so again, you know, ask questions as we go along. And then I'll pass it over to Stephanie if you could tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Jason. Stephanie Friedman is my name. Um, yeah, so I spent my uh, professional life uh, in, in the startup world. I've done three um, successful startups, all in the enterprise space. Um, the last startup was Xamarin. I joined that, I think, in 2012 as the first non-engineering hire. And Xamarin grew from basically me to 100 salespeople, about 50 million in run rate. And then we were um, acquired by Microsoft in 2016. And um, yeah, that's a good, good summary. Thank you. Over to you. Bill? My turn. Uh, Bill Lapsevic. Uh, uh, my background is also in sort of enterprise class software, but also also from smaller startups perspective. Uh, I was the third employee at New Relic, and I was there until after we went public. We were about 1,200 people when I left. Um, uh, while there, I ran business development, and then later on, in a more operating role, customer success, support, uh, services, and education. Um, and then I moved on to a company called Sentry, uh, which if you're developers, you probably have heard of. Um, uh, at Sentry, I was the chief operating officer, and I had basically everything that wasn't HR and engineering uh, reporting into me. So I, the sales, customer success, business development, and uh, marketing. Um, and so that's, that's me. Cool. Thank you, Bill. We could talk about some of the companies we've been at and some of our experience, and just kind of like what the sales team looked like, and then we'll just kind of <laughs> deep dive or like go from there. So I've been at Heroku for about a year and a half. Heroku has a scaled sales model where we primarily sell via the product. So we lead with a freemium motion. Um, we engage with in-product marketing. And so what that looks, and this is our primary sales rev um, channel where most of our revenue actually comes from is self-service. And so what that is is customers come in, developers come in, they sign up for free, they start using the product, and then we tailor the product experience and the marketing experience based on who you are and how you're using the product and try to get you to grow organically. And then what we do is we trigger motions or signals out to the sales organization that say like, hey, five people signed up from Deloitte. Or this person signed up from a Gmail account, but they added an expensive add-on and high performance monitoring. Um, so it looks like they're actually starting to do something real with the app. And so we'll set, like, set those triggers. And at that point, the online sales team will call the customer, email the customer, and basically try to figure out like, what they're doing and how we can help them. And so that's our primary go-to-market. On top of that, we have what we call our enterprise go-to-market, which is you know, your typical Fortune 500, Russell 2000 kind of company. Um, so what other people might consider sort of mid-market and above, but people who want to sign, you know, spend 100000 a year or more. Um, and so that's more of your, your sort of typical sales motion, where you have like an enterprise AE, they get engaged, you know, they're dealing with procurement and IT, because typically on the customer side, you have typical sales motion roles. So then we have that. And then we are owned by Salesforce. Salesforce acquired us about seven years ago. And so we do plug into the, the broader Salesforce machine, which is if you're a fast growing company, you know, we've had Uber and Lyft and Stitch Fix and I mean, name sort of the, the monster company. All of them have been on our platform. And as you get to a certain level, then you tend to need for like um, Salesforce automation, CRM, service tools. And so that's when we bring in the broader Salesforce organization. Before that, I was over at Adobe where I helped build out Adobe's go-to-market for the creative cloud transformation um, and their go-to-market for the marketing cloud once, it, once we built that as a business. And so sort of took those two SaaS businesses live for Adobe. Sorry, go ahead. Awesome, great. Um, so when I joined Xamarin, I was basically the, the, the first salesperson slash head of sales at the same time. So as a you know, trailblazer salesperson, I did you know, the lead follow-up and, um, and, and customer meetings, but also implemented the lead to cash and like the tools and the, and the process. And so basically what we started out doing at Xamarin was um, very developer focused uh, work, meaning um, developers would download our software and then really our work would be to, first of all, help them, help them understand that um, building mobile apps with C-sharp 
natively can actually work. That was the first step we needed to do as a sales motion. Um, and then the second step would be almost customer success before somebody buys is like, let me help you build your first app. So we learned very quickly if somebody has, you know, tried it out and then they launched their first app, we've got them. Yeah. That, that's our customer. So, <coughs> so I built basically a very customer success focused team early on. Uh, it was very um, SMB and mid-market, um, always just a single team, even with the larger you know, mid-market companies. But pretty quickly, larger organizations also were downloading our software, and we started an, an enterprise approach as well, where we had to kind of prove, you know, you can, yes, you can integrate that with your backend. Yes, we know how to help you with security. And in order to do that, I had then to bring on board you know, more, more experienced, um, almost mobile architects, mobile engineers, on my team that were able to, to, to help customers make that happen. So that was the setup, SMB, it grew to mid-market in an enterprise uh, motion. And then on, on top of that, a very important um, route to market for us was the digital agencies and system integrators. So I had a dedicated team actually to work with partners. It was about you know 15 of 100 people, but about a third of my revenue. So by far the biggest revenue, you know, productivity per, per salesperson, so to speak. So that was really um, an interesting aspect of, of, of Xamarin as well. Cool, thank you. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, so at New Relic, uh, we had an interesting start for our sales organization at New Relic because we were dead set against ever having a salesperson ever <laughs> for any reason whatsoever. In fact, the CEO wrote a blog post that was called Death of a Salesman. You could probably <laughs> still find it. Uh, it. It wasn't a violent blog post. It was just... It, it was a little marketing thing that he tried to do there. Well, it was just to welcome you to the organization. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that was great. Um, no, I, I, when I, so when we started New Relic, um, I was actually uh, primarily there to, to create partnerships, right? And partnerships were what were going to drive uh, adoption for us uh, and cause word of mouth. And then we just assumed that the product was going to be so awesome that people were just going to upgrade and it would yeah. sell itself. And uh, it kind of did at the beginning. Um, and what we found was pretty quickly that there were a bunch of other questions that were coming in on top of, hey, I just paid for your product. You know, things like, where's my t-shirt, right? <laughs> I deployed, I want my t-shirt. Or things like, hey, what kind of support are you offering here? Or uh, I didn't think the contract said that I was supposed to be here for a full year. I thought I could just switch from an annual price to a monthly price. Anyway, there were all sorts of non-product related questions that started coming in the door as soon as people started buying the product. And so we hired this guy uh, named Steve, and we said, Steve, your job is just to answer these questions. He wasn't officially going to be a salesperson. <clears throat> and so Steve sat there and he answered the questions. And then in one exec staff meeting, we were sitting there and we happened to look at uh, the two cohorts of Steve accounts and not Steve accounts. And we noticed that all the Steve accounts were paying us three times what the not Steve accounts were paying us. And somebody raised their hand and said, you know, I think we might need more Steves. <laughs> not to say the word, salesperson, right? We're no, like, they, wouldn't no. Say that the, they wouldn't <laughs> say that at the time. Um, and I don't know if you, you know, New Relic now is a, is a huge enterprise sales organization, right? They sell, they have account management, they've got customer success. They have uh, regional people all around the world. They've got offices in Australia and in Europe, largely sales offices. Um, and the reason that they do that is it turns out that you can get people to use your product um, just by having a cool product. But if you really want them to use it and get the most value, salespeople are actually really an important part of that process. So we started out with lots of Steves. They ended up fo forming an inside sales team. And then as that grew, we started realizing that people actually wanted people to come and visit, right? To build a personal relationship. Because once you get to a certain price point, people aren't just going to put a credit card in, right? They'll want to either talk to somebody or see somebody. And so we started hiring what we called mid-market and enterprise reps, people who had larger companies with a different skill set, right? The, these reps, the skill sets were all about how do you take a small pocket of success where one development team has bought your product and find all the other development teams Land and, and somehow bridge that gap, 
yeah. right? Land, yeah. and expand. land and expand. Exactly. And I think the important aspect here is though that like, you know, keeping your audience into a, a, um, account, right? Like if you're mm -hmm. selling to a very technical audience or you're selling to developers, I think you need to um, have a very respectful approach. You know, you help your, you don't sell really, you help your customer buy. Yes. Um, and that, that, makes a, that makes a big difference. In the early days, it can mean my, my first, I don't know, five or six um, IC sales hires were all mobile engineers that were actually just talking to our customers yeah, via email or chat or on the phone. Point. Yeah. Um, especially for the founders here, like what yeah. did you guys look for in those first uh, sales hires? So you say you had a realization like, holy crap, we need to get out of just the founders, you know, yeah. and actually have like real salespeople. Like what were the skill sets? What were the personality types? So, so I've thought about this a lot actually in the last weeks. Um, I think the very first person that you hire, and you might have been that for New Relic, is kind of what I like to call the trailblazer person that ideally has some sales and business development background, and they help you figure out the sales motion. They help you figure out what to do and what you need. And then more often than not, you're Steve, or like, you know, in, on, on my team, you know, Andrew Way, Bitte, David Hathaway, the people we hired then, they were deeply technical but they were happy to speak to customers and just happy to explain and happy to be helpful. And they were amazing salespeople, so to speak, without never really actually aggressively selling. Yeah. And our customers loved the conversations with them and they just had you know, so much value. So I just feel like you have to, no matter what you sell, you have to create value at every single touch point. And if you have a developer in front of you, that just means you need to be able to help the developer figure out their problems. Um, and then the, the, the selling, turns into something that's just really helping them buy. Yeah. yeah. Money yeah. Al almost changes hand as a side effect of the yeah. conversation. Yeah, that value, the value uh, that the salesperson provides, if you're not providing value, especially if you're selling into development organizations, that's right. you're going to get the phone hung up on you. You're not going to get your emails responded. And even, you know, I'm not a developer. I don't play a developer on TV. I, <laughs> I, the last thing I coded was Lunar Lander and Basic. So it's been a long time. Um, but when a salesperson calls me and gives me one of those cliche, uh, or gives me one of those cliche emails about how, oh, you know, you must not be paying attention to X, Y, or Z, or whatever it is, mm. instantly I shut down and I'm like, mm -hmm. I don't want to talk to this fool. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, so to the point mm. of who are you hiring in your sales in your salespeople, you, you're you're hiring um, consultative approach people, who are who have a very customer focus. They're, they're looking for what pain point do you have and how can I take anything that our company has and help you use that to solve your problem, whatever that takes. It's not all about price and it's not all about positioning except in that you're trying to show them how your product literally can help them uh, solve whatever pain point Where they have. Where did you guys find your um, so your first sales hire? So the people who are li maybe a little bit more like technical account manager as opposed to hardcore p selling AE. Mm -hmm. um, what did you call them? Yeah. And where did you find them? Like the ones who were the most successful? Like what kind of backgrounds did they come from? What kind of companies did they come from? So um, the first few hires we hired, interestingly enough, most of our user base and of our customers, huh. which is something that yeah. you obviously need to do very, very we carefully. Did the same. Yeah. Yeah. Like, hey, you love the product so much. Come work for <laughs> oh, us. Exactly. <laughs> You're really good at this. Um, you, with larger accounts, if you hire somebody out of the account, you have to be obviously very careful. But of sometimes course. that can actually mean that that customer has somebody on the inside, so to speak. Yeah. And we had some accounts that developed wonderfully because they had their person basically within Xamarin helping them even even more. Um, and then within the community, we obviously Xamarin is an open source based. Um, we had a huge open source community. Contributors, active people in the community were a, a fantastic way for us for us to hire. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we um, we took a slightly different approach to that. Um, we actually got a lot of our engineers that way. Mm -hmm. um, we had a couple of in network hires, people that we knew and and loved and and trusted and had seen operate in that highly technical, consultative approach before. And if you can find somebody like that who you already know, boy, that's a great start to your sales force because you, you avoid the cultural challenge right away. Um, and then we actually found a lot of people with high technical aptitudes who weren't nece necessarily technical people, right? But had the other skills that were necessary how to... Did, how did you present. test for that? Um, you talk to them. Yeah. Uh, you can... You can 
you can kind of tell within the first 20 minutes if yeah, they understand what you're, there. if they come in and they understand what they've done their research, they understand what your product can do. Yep. They start asking all the questions about how are the customers using this. Um, you get a, you definitely get a, a sense for it. It's not, it's not a perfect science. Yeah. Uh, one of our best salespeople early on at New Relic had come from selling loose leaf tea to distributors. Huh. And I'm telling you, he blew the doors off because he had to build a relationship with the customer. Yeah. And he had enough technical aptitude to fully understand what the product was all about and why developers found various things important. Right? We also supplemented that with engineering help. Of course. Right? Yeah. And so when the technical question got too tough, an engineer would come in and say, well, this is how you fix that problem, or this is how it works at a very deep level. Yeah. But most of the time, uh, you know, that was one, a one-to-many relationship, engineer to, to sales team. And, and I think so later on when we were actually bringing in, you know, more classic account executives, yeah. I think <laughs> what you want to look for is, is, is three things. So first of all, they need to have sold to your audience before. Right? To, like find out who your audience is, find somebody who's been selling to that audience. Um, somebody who has been successful more often than not, you know, past success is the best predictor for future success. And then in terms of the, 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 the skills or the attributes, I think there are three things that really make a sales person very pleasant. It's are they authentic? Are they curious, intellectually, intellectually curious, and are they helpful? Um, I, I find that these three attributes kind of make, uh, make a person kind of a pleasant conversation partner in more than you know, most, uh, mo most um, situations. And as a salesperson, they'll just have a good, co good relationship with their customers. So what advice would you guys have? You know, somebody's looking to make their first sales hire, or maybe they have a couple of salespeople, but they're maybe junior, they don't have a CRO or somebody at a senior level. Like what should somebody look for when they're starting to build out like that stub for their like a real sales organization? So I'm happy to start with that. Um, I, so I think, you know, your first head of sales needs to be really smart. Um, they need to be analytical because they need to help you fine tune your, your repeatable sales motion, right? So you, the first year or two years, you're, you're constantly learning and fine tuning your messaging, who you're selling to, what's the pricing, um, where do you, how do you reach your customers? All that needs to be learned and then fine tuned and improved over time. And I mean, you keep learning, you know, for the rest of your you yeah. know, life at the company. But the first couple of years, until you've really locked that down, that that aspect is really important. So I think they need to um, really have been successful in the past, and they need to understand their own success. So when you ask them at this company, that company, what worked, what didn't, you're looking for a very open conversation about that. There's at startup, there's that's so right. much stuff that doesn't work, and that's, that's right. fine because you you experiment, you try something out, but then you learn and you learn quickly. That's right. Um, so you know, openness and awareness the of, of their own is success. Super key and the, yeah. the willingness to like they may come from another company where something worked, but that willingness to experiment and adapt because you're going to go through a million failures. Yes. Right. Yes. And really figuring out like what the message is, who the customer is, what's the right sales motion. So somebody who's like and they're transparent about that, especially if you don't speak their language. You know, that's always the hardest where it's like, I don't know what this guy actually or, or gal actually does day to day. Yeah. And the more that they can kind of explain, like, here's the thought process, right? Yeah. Like being transparent. All oh, this mm -hmm. didn't work. Now we're going to try this. Yeah. Um, but I think that those are key things to yeah. look for. Yeah, totally. Bill. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to, uh, I, I agree with everything that Stephanie just said. I think those are all super important. Another uh, often overlooked uh, component to hiring your first couple of salespeople or your or your first head of sales uh, in a company that it was founded and run by engineers or developers is that you probably already have an engineering culture there and so you're looking for somebody who can interact and and uh, in a respectful way and become part of the company culture right. yeah. if you bring in somebody who is too oriented on sales 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 there's going to be an allergic reaction in your organization, and it's just not going to work. Um, the, the critical uh, moment at Century where our salespeople started being accepted by the engineering organization was when one of the engineers came to me and said, Bill, I just realized sales is just as much a data-driven, process-oriented thing, science, as it is as engineering is. And he was exactly right. Um, the sales process, the way you treat sales as an analytical process mm -hmm. and, and where you use data to derive the next steps 
uh, and, and have a repeatable process is very analogous to how you develop a product. Um, and it's, a, it's an interesting awakening. If you can find somebody who understands that and can bridge that gap between the engineering organization and sales organization, in addition to having all the qualities yeah. that Stephanie said, then you've got an all-star. Yeah. And the other thing I would just add to that, sorry, just real quick. Um, sales and support are the people that talk to your customers. And so being really mindful, like they're the face of your company, right? They're the brand of your company. They're like what your customers and people out in the market are going to ultimately think about your company. And so just really also making sure that they have that personality type, you know, and it's sort of as a mesh of like, how do you want your company to be perceived? Because they're going to actually be the boots on the ground that are interacting with your customers. And so for your first like CSG hire, your first sales hire, you know, or even like any of your first like couple hires, yeah. it's just like really making sure like you're 100% comfortable, like these are the people that are going to be out there interacting with the people on your platform. Mm -hmm. And then I think one, one more thing, um, when you interview, especially this first VP sales or head of sales, but you're still early stage, that person needs to be eager to be talking to customers. So be, be careful if somebody's too, you know, removed and wants to hire immediately three reps and, and have a big structure and a, an EA and an operations person. Like th th that first sales hire needs to, even if they are a VP, roll up their sleeves and be eager, follow up with leads, mm -hmm. make calls, you know, meet with customers. That's what they do in the early days. I think that's yeah. really, real important. One thing I would also add to that is even when you hire your sales team, as founders or as head of product, you should still be involved as much as possible in sales calls. You know, and getting that feedback directly, really understanding that process, because quite often people could say, like, hey, I come from an engineering background. Cool, I hired a person to go solve that problem. I'm like, I'm done with that. And just kind of go back into the hole. Um, and I think that especially for early companies, like, that's toxic, right? Like, that's not good for you. You want to get that feedback loop of just really understanding, like, what's working in the field? Mm -hmm. What are people willing to pay for? What are they not interested in paying for? Um, really hearing that firsthand. Uh, we had a couple questions, so we'll go first here in the front. and then It's almost hard to answer without knowing a little more. Are you, eight, you eight people, everybody's technical in the company so far? Yeah, and mm -hmm. uh, mostly the co-founders, like as the founders, we're doing the sales. Yeah. How much inbound stuff do you have? Do you have people that are knocking on the door asking questions, or uh, the opposite, which is you know, no one's doing that, and you've actually had to use your networks to go out and, and find people? Because that will, that will drive which of those many roles you want to you wanna hire first. For example, um, we didn't need a marketing person at New Relic early on because through business development we had you know four or five hundred interested customers that were coming through the door. What we needed was somebody to field those questions. Yeah. Um, so we went with <coughs> hiring a salesperson first, and not even a head of sales, just a salesperson whose job it was to kind of field things and then provide feedback to the organization. Um, we didn't know what our sales process was. We didn't know what. Uh, head of sales would do or what type of head of sales we needed until we had done a little more interaction with with the customers in a sales type environment. Um, so it's important to think through what's going on I with your leads that are coming in and how you're interacting with your customers. And what I'd say is find where the, the bulk of the work is and, and kind of hire for that first. Yeah, and it depends a bit on your go-to-market. Um, also, you know, are you selling something that is very mass market sort of, you know, to tons of people who are maybe smaller deals? Are you selling mm -hmm. something that's like big enterprise, you have to go land a couple big accounts? Are you selling something that goes through a reseller or a partner or an SI? It, uh, it really depends on like what kind of skill set you need. Like what, like how does your product, you know, how, how should it be sold? Um. If, so and, and I think if, if you have a, a you know, reasonable amount of inbound interest, I think, if because that's often when people think about hiring their, their first salesperson, right? If you have some amount of inbound interest, what I've seen work, I've been working with a fair number of startups lately, and what I've seen work well often is as the first sales hire, if you don't have a business founder that has a deep, you know, sales background, then bring somebody in who's kind of like a junior VP sales, like a head of sales, director sales, who's very much you know, analytical, able to help you figure out all these things. Who are our customers really? How do we, what's the message? What is the repeatable sales motion with which we scale? Um, and then often you kind of add as the next person kind of like a trailblazer account yeah. exec or sales rep, so they are two. And often a third hire at this point is either an SDR and or a customer success person. So you end up with this pod two salespeople, SDR, and customer success. Mm -hmm. And then you bring that part to productivity, meaning yeah. they have quotas, even just early stage imaginable, 
imaginary quotas, but they could fulfill those quotas. And then if that is working and you think you have a repeatable sales motion, bring in two more AEs and maybe one more SDR, one more customer success, you create the next pod like that. Yeah. If that also comes up to productivity, meaning you can give them quotas and they're bringing in the money, then you bring two more. At that point, you have to stop and look at where you are. To me, that's that's, that's the right. make it scalable. I, I think about it as three phases. It's build. That's what you're doing right now. It's just the founders. Then you try to make it scalable until like seven or eight salespeople. Is it scalable? And only if everybody here, the metrics are right, then you accelerate. That's, that's often a serious B kind of stage. That's when you kind of hit the gas and accelerate and really, really scale yeah, the business. Um, I've seen a lot more success with that. Like uh, if you happen to know somebody who is an amazing senior CRO that's out that you guys have worked together, you know it's going to work, then maybe go that route. Mm -hmm. um, but this route, which is more like the founders are still involved in the sales process, you just figure out how you augment yourself, right? Like take the day-to-day the -day grunt work, but you're still overseeing, you're still involved, and you're sort of expanding that out until you really understand your motion and really understand what you're looking for before you exactly. go bring like another big, like expensive, big ego kind of person in. Then all of a sudden you're like, how do I get control of my company again? Um, and so I found a lot more success with that, which is like hire some more maybe junior, senior kind of people who are like, they're good enough, they're scrappy enough, they can kind of figure it out, but you're still very much involved in overseeing that process. And uh, I'm finding the big ego people, honestly, never really that helpful in uh, any company. Yeah. You know, your title shouldn't matter. And in the, yeah. the first set on year and a half, I was just head of sales at Zyron. I didn't care. Um, just make the companies, that's the edit, you just make the company yeah. successful, make your customer successful, that's really what matters. And everything else kind of will, will happen. Uh, the biggest mistake that I see happen in that regard is following the money too much. You know, you get somebody, let's say you're just starting to get a handle on your sales motion, you've got 10 or 20 customers and it seems to feel pretty good, you're starting to get a couple of deals here and there, everyone's kind of exciting. And then in through the door walks a giant opportunity that is just a little bit to the left of what you're doing and what you think works. But man, it would be nice to get all that money. Oh, the money. Or that brand. Or the brand, the brand or whatever. Yeah. Don't do it. I can land that logo. <laughs> yeah. I'm, just telling you, yeah. I'm just telling you right now, don't do it. Um, be rigorous in saying that, that is not our customer right now. Yeah. Right? Couple things. One is, they probably will still be there because they're probably going to be a successful company too. They'll probably still be there in a year or two when you're ready for that type of customer. Thing number two is stepping outside your motion that seems to be working, even a little bit, can be deadly because you cannot, you, you, you always underestimate the friction that it causes right. in your organization to have mm -hmm. to support suddenly those guys over there. Yeah. You're like, oh, we'll build the support, but, but we also have to hire somebody to deal that, that thing over there, right? It really is painful. And so to the extent that you can keep boundaries around the customer that you want that is going to be successful your, with your product, do that. Right. That's uh, th I think that's my biggest learning there. Yeah. One thing I would just add about the getting to know um, a lot of junior people or sort of inexperienced salespeople don't understand. Like there's you hardly ever get told no. Right. Like people are just uncomfortable, whatever. Like, and so um, but you get soft no's. Right. Like deals that will just drag on forever or it's a person who's not in power. They don't have budget. They're not making a decision. <laughs> And so just really having a rigor around defining your sales process of like, you know, when is the lead qualified? Like, when are you going to actually follow up? Like, you know, understanding your pipe of like when you think it's like reasonable to actually close yeah. and like instilling that rigor in your sales team, which is like, this is a soft no. Like this customer is never going to close, like stop wasting time on this person or else you can find that you're wasting time on like most of your time on people who will never buy something from you. And so just being mindful of that, which is like they'll say <laughs> like very rarely does the prospects actually say no. Like, oh, next month, or I got to go talk to this, or I got to go do this. And meanwhile, like months go by. Stephanie, anything and you would add? Yeah, yeah. And I, so I think being really crystal clear, I think there's a methodology to some of these things. For example, your ideal customer profile. That's something you just very early on, you need to write that out. And also the, the opposite of that, right? Who do we absolutely never want to sell to right now? Be very crystal clear and have that, you know, be um, be your, your 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 guiding star at any given point, right? And and be very strict ar around that. And then really going through your your customer's journey and understand from their perspective how they buy. I think it's so easy to talk about the you know the sales cycle and how we want to sell to them, but it's I think really important to get into the customer's head and understand how they want to buy. 
and, and then really follow them along, along those steps. And if they're then not making those steps, then they're not going to buy. So it's easier that's to right. recognize it then if you kind of really always put yourselves into the customer's perspective. So that's really important on that sort of steps to know is even very early, um, start building out the formula for your sales process and really understanding the calculus of, you know, how, what's our average time to close? What's average deal size, sort of customer segmentation? Um, how many leads do we need? You know, how many leads do we mm. need that are then qualified? How many leads do we need in each step to understand like how much money we're going to actually close each quarter? Um, you're going to be horribly wrong when you first start, but just like building that harness to start understanding, like you know, like how do things trickle through your funnel, and really understanding that, is so you can understand and you get to the point where it's like, okay, I could tell you two years from now how much money I'm going to have, right, based on how many people I'm talking to right now. But starting to build that mentality and that process like early on, and that also helps you go back to the sales reps to be like, you got to get better because you've had this lead open for <laughs> I don't know nine months, um, but you now have the calculus and sort of an understanding that you can have those kind of conversations. That goes back to what Bill was saying about like sales should be very analytical and mm -hmm. data driven. You know, who's out there? Like how big is your market? How many people do you have? How many people can each person talk to? Of those people, how many is going to ultimately become a qualified lead? You know, how long does it take to close a lead? And then when you start hiring people or maybe yourself, you can start looking at that going, okay, like where are the weak parts in this funnel? Like do I shorten lead time? Do I need to get more leads? Do I need, but basically you, you understand the calculus behind that. You can figure out like what are my levers in the sales process and how do I improve this? One way to get people, uh, get salespeople to get to know a little bit faster, or at least to decide when, uh, when something's not going to close one day, is to teach them that uh, you all, that your fixed resource is time, right? And if you're only going to get X dollars per minute in a day, or in a in a quarter, and you're spending all that time on somebody who's not That's paying right. you, you're not going to make your quota, right? And so you can turn it into a math equation. I think at any given stage, you want to incentivize people for what is important to you at that time, right? In the very first months or year, that can be just learning. So it could be as, as you know, simple as having a document every week that's like objectives, uh, observations, learnings, recommendations. Like you need to give me this document every week or every month, or probably every week. Every month seems incredibly long in startup time. Um, and if, if this is a you know, valuable document, that is when you're at 100%. Um, and then when you just want to have more customer conversations, more leads, more conversations, you could pay them on, I want, you know, 15 customer conversations per week. Uh, when these, you know, progress into proposals, is I want to have six proposals per week, I want to have 20 conversations, um, and, and uh, you know, one opportunity closed, you know, one customer won. And you can basically, without having to give a dollar quota, because often you don't know even yet, you know, what's your average selling price and how many deals can somebody close. So you don't want to frustrate people by giving them a quota and then they are like way off. Um, so you can kind of inch yourself up towards a dollar quota that will then allow you to, once you actually give dollar quotas, make them reasonable and achievable. Because I do think that Salespeople have to be able to over overachieve. I've started out as a salesperson, you know, many years ago myself. Let me tell you, there's nothing more frustrating um, th not than not having a chance, not not being yeah. over 100 percent. You just even just like 97 percent of quota feels horrible to most salespeople. So yeah. the, let's not let's not uh, let's have That's them really overachieve. Like most salespeople view, I mean, literally 99 percent is a failure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right? Um, they take good. it really hard. Where it's just, I mean, and so salespeople stereotypically, right, tend to be incredibly competitive. Yeah. Um, that's why a lot of people come from like sports backgrounds. Um, and it could definitely be overdone. And that's one thing like to be mindful of when you're still like setting quotas, because it could definitely be overdone. So it's kind of like you want somebody and so bec but because of the competitive thing, like the 99% is like a total failure. Um, but sorry, go ahead. Yeah. And how would you think about, um, you know, setting their quota of, like 30% salary, 50%, 100%? Like, how would you think about what have well, you experienced on ranges? Yeah, that th I mean, the, the kind of the, the go-to is 50-50, right? From like a, a traditional salesperson has like a 50% base and 50% variable. In the early days, when there's so much unknown still, I've, I've often seen 60 or 70 or even 80% yeah. base yeah. In, in a yeah. smaller variable. How that's about you? What, that's what we did yeah. at Century. We, um, we started people because we knew that we didn't have our motion down and we, didn't, we couldn't guarantee that sales were ever going to come in the door, honestly, <laughs> for the salesperson. We set it up with a, with a pretty high base salary to start. And I, when I say a pretty high base salary, we were actually probably underpaying that first sales rep overall, right? And what ends up happening is as you develop your sales organization and you start bringing in more and more experience, 
and the people that you had earlier start getting more and more experience, you actually can right size it pretty easily if you started out with a bit of a higher base because they'll have maybe 70, 30 base to incentive, but that 70 is still relatively low compared to a very experienced salesperson, right? And so you can right size it and balance it later. Um, we also started by not worrying about individual sales quotas. Um, we actually gave a team quota, mm -hmm. right? We said, the sales team needs to try and bring in this amount of money, right? And we use that as a driver to, uh, to say, we think you can do this, um, and to get people to shoot for something that was relatively big, but not be overly penalized if they didn't get there, right? And eventually, that stops working, but what it does in the short term, when you have your three or four salespeople all pushing for the same sales quota, is they start collaborating. Right, because they want to help everybody else, help them get to the quota. And that's a really that's good right. thing when they start collaborating and sharing ideas. Mm -hmm. If you can create that culture with your first three, four, five salespeople, then when you go to uh, individual quotas, then everybody celebrates everybody else. That's right. Right, And that's a really good kind of virtuous circle yeah. uh, situation to be in. That's a really important concept regardless of what size organization you're in is um, salespeople are, are incredibly driven by quota, even if the quota is only, or um, even if like the variable is only 10% of their overall salary, right? It's just like something about that competitive. And so being super mindful of like, what are you rewarding? Um, and what are the, you know, potentially unintended consequences across the organization if you're rewarding the bad behavior? Because mm -hmm. there's definitely, I'm sure we've all had experience where you end up with like sick sales cultures because people are competing against each other or they're overly aggressive with um, customers. And so just being very mindful of like, what are you measuring? What are you rewarding? How much are you rewarding? And like, how does that impact other people in the organization? So I love that idea of the team sort of quota when you're starting out. And then I think to add to that, um, what I've also seen work really well is to have a base goal and a stretch goal, especially mm. in the early days when you really yeah. don't know yet. You Would know? you do accelerators for the stretch? Maybe for okay. the, exactly for yeah. everybody, you know, if we, as if we yep. had a lot of team goals as well. Like if we hit the stretch, everybody gets another $500 or another 1000 or, you know, something. Um, and especially if you don't know, you know, your base goal could be 100,000, your stretch could be 300. It could be a massive, you know, because you don't know because there's some bigger first deals that might or might absolutely not come through, you don't know. And so I think base and stretch allows you to manage that. And the base goal is something that I think ideally the team should always hit because again, even as a team, you know, you feel better if you can yeah. actually make your number at least the base. Yeah. Um, and then the stretch is something that you want to just really challenge everybody to bring their best into the, the company every single day, right? To go above and beyond. And if you hire the right people, you'll, you know, create a lot of energy that way. You don't necessarily share that stretch plan with the board, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. But um, it's something that you, you know, you manage yourself and your team against. And every month or every quarter, you try to hit that. And, you know, sometimes you will, and it'll feel really great. So it sometimes feels for... Um, some of the technical founders that I've worked with in the past, it feels really icky. I think that's the word I meant to use, icky. Uh, to say, um, to give these incentives above what you expect to pay a sales rep. And sometimes you essentially are giving them potentially unlimited earning potential, mm -hmm. right? Don't be afraid to do that. Yeah. Because so you overpaid them, right? let's say they hit 500% of their quota. Like, damn, that's great. They yeah. hit 500% of their quota. You got awesome. five times what you expected out of that person. Pay them, right? You're gonna find ultimately that if you're doing this right, your, your margins on salespeople are very high because it's all incentive based. That's right. <laughs> right, if you're paying a 50% base, that's the only part you ever have to pay if they fail. That's right. The key right. thing that I'll just add to that is because I've definitely been in situations where somebody's come in way over, right? And somebody's getting like, you know, a half a million dollar check, you know? And so as an organization that at times can be really hard to write, but if you mess with that, you've undermined your entire sales organization, yeah. right? When people are just like, wait a minute, like it's a contract between us on how this works because something happened that you didn't account for because I overachieved. Now all of a sudden you want to punish me and so, like, don't ever do that. Um, set the, even set if you the feel like we got it terribly wrong, that. just suck it up and move on. If, um, if you write a salesperson a, a five, $500,000 check, it means something went really well. That's right. It yeah, went really well, <laughs> and you're just like, thank you, you for doing that. Dollars. We'll figure it out next year. Yeah. 
Um, but once you undermine that, like you can never come back from that. And so be super mindful of that. But, but I think just to conclude this maybe, um, given the complexity of all this, and we, we see just you know, the nuanced conversation that we're having here, I think having an early hire being a, a director of sales or a, a junior VP sales that can help you with all these considerations and then really making sure that trailblazer sales leader plus his first sales hire, those two are figuring out the repeatable sales model and not necessarily scaling beyond more people beyond those two until you have figured, until at least you think you've figured that out, will help you not to waste a huge amount of your money on like 10 salespeople. Everybody's trying to do you know, something, but you're not quite sure what. Yeah, long, long list of things. I start? Yeah, Okay. Uh, cool. go, go ahead. Go. So long list of things. Um, so I've started over time to, to try to become like really thoughtful about how to build the process over time, right? I think when you are on customer conversation, in customer conversations, Call prep and call debrief is key. This is where you learn and where the salesperson learns. Mm -hmm. So no customer call without an agenda, meaning without having prepared for it, and no customer call without having debriefed. Three yep. simple questions. What worked? What didn't work? And what do we have to blueprint? Blueprint meaning this is something we'll always do from now on, or this will, will, we'll never do from now on. Then I think pipeline meetings, you need to use those, especially in the early days, to learn yep. um, within the sales org. And then I think QBRs. Pipeline meeting is just a sales team where yep. you discuss and learn, and then QBRs, you should bring your CEO, your CTO, any That's other right. stakeholders of the organization. The chief product person, chief your customer product success. Yes, yeah. exactly. Everybody's in there. That's where you discuss every month or every quarter what you have learned and what works and doesn't work. Um, I think that's just the beginning of kind of like a methodology on how to, on, and how to get feedback and figure out, figure out what works very quickly. Yep. Yeah, I, I think you've, you've hit on most of the big things. Um, I've seen um, good, regular, company-wide uh, email or, or some kind of communication, document communication, where you talk about wins and how they happened and what was the key learning, and then you make sure you thank every single person that was involved in that, e yeah. in, in that deal. Because you're gonna, what you ultimately want to create is this feeling that everyone is on the sales the team. The team win. Mm -hmm. Right, um, that's very important, and so too is. Hey, we had this big opportunity, and we lost. And here's why we lost. Right. And here's how, morning. as an organization, we're going to not do that again. Right? Whether it's back to the, you know, it was something we shouldn't have been chasing, or whether it's we made a mistake, or we weren't ready for this. Whatever it is, these learnings, if you can get them to everyone in your in your organization it makes your organization genetically smarter that's right and mm -hmm. you'll learn faster after that yeah so processes that i've always put in place is i start every week with a business call um and i try to do that as early as possible on monday morning because to me like that sets the tone for the overall business um mm -hmm. what's coming in what's working what's not working customers who are growing customers who are shrinking but it's basically it's our business review um at salesforce i do it at nine o'clock on monday morning um, at Adobe, it was eight o'clock on Monday, but it's literally Stay like, and I, and I do that on purpose, <laughs> right? But it's just like, it's like, it sets who's, the, who's the serious call? tone, right? Who's on that call? So I had a product, mm -hmm. um, my other sales peers who own other parts of sales. Mm -hmm. uh, we have our head of business operations, mm -hmm. uh, head of support, but it's literally like the health of the business, right? Like, how, like what's going on? Yep. Then once a month we do um, a deep dive and that's the winners and losers. Um, you know, like what did we win? What did we lose? Why? But it's that post-mortem, and again, like that's customer success, that's head of product, it's head of engineering, mm -hmm. um, it's head of business operations. But it's just like as an organization talking about like, you know, do we not have features? Are we priced incorrectly? Um, is there something going on out in the market that we're all of a sudden we're losing against somebody who like before we weren't losing to? Um, customers have new objections. Um, but really making sure like it, it's on the schedule, right? And everybody shows up and it's like a pretty rigorous agenda. But just building that in where people just know like, okay, here's a meeting and you know, there's gonna be expected outcomes. Like we come out of that with squads. So it's sort of like, oh, we have increased attrition, you know, last month. These three people are gonna go, we'll work on it. And the next month when we get back together, like they're on deck for reporting back in, like mm -hmm. what happened? Um, or we're losing on price all of a sudden against somebody else. Um, these three people get assigned, they're gonna come back in a month and talk about like, here's what we should do about it. Do we, you know, credits or discounting or repricing or, in more features, whatever the case may be, but it's like come back with a recommendation. But having that kind of cross-functional team that just exists um, is something I found to be, uh, to be helpful. As you guys have scaled your teams, and so say you're now getting to the point where you have like these multiple pods and squads, 
how do you think about segmentation? How do you think about, you know, um, like which customer segment and maybe we should now have like bifurcation, trifurcation, sort of go after different motions. Have you guys thought about scaling that up or different geos or different, you know, sort yeah. of business segments? You have to pay attention to the patterns. Um, you're going to find uh, if you look at your customer base regularly and you kind of review what types of customers they are, um, you're going to find different size customers do things differently. They buy differently. There are different processes. When you get really big, there are all sorts of other processes you have to take into account for. And then you're going to look at what features and capabilities do each, uh, do each perfect customer uh, need to use and who's using them. Um, so you have to look at all of these things. Um, we start, you start out with a big lump of customers. And then you will notice over time, you'll notice that some are just doing things pockets, differently. Yeah. And then what you have to do is evaluate, is that a pattern that we have to break out separately? Um, the first one that sales teams often encounter is, um, is big companies buy differently. Yep. Right? It's no longer, hey, you know, the, the head of engineering uh, is just going to put this on his credit card. Right? It's now we got to get the CFO to sign off on this and That's a purchase right. order done IT and the and budgeting finance, process yeah. to be taken care of and all that craziness. Uh, and as soon as you start seeing that, then you also end up with security reviews and all sorts of corporate governance and different you know, RFIs and RFPs. And those are, that's a materially different sales process than sort of your inbound small company uh, I'm going to tell you about the product, and you're going to say, "Yeah, that's really great," and give me your credit card. Credit right? card. Yeah. Um, and that's where that's where you first often start segmenting. Um, you, I, I found at least in infrastructure tools like Sentry and New Relic, we didn't get to verticalization until like year ten, yeah. right? Because it, these are very horizontal products. You're you're selling to a class of customer that has developers. And so they're using developer tools. And that's what these, these things that I've been selling are. Um, there was no very little difference between somebody who was a developer for a healthcare company and somebody who's a developer for an e-commerce company. Yeah, the, their code looks different, but they're still doing largely the same stuff. Anything to add? Yeah, yeah, a couple of thoughts here. I think so, as like in this build, in this early stage, right, it's about figuring out the repeatable sales motion. Once you've found that and you start to scale, Really what it's all about is maximizing sales team productivity, which means you want to specialize people. So that, that's what kind of thinks that what's underneath all of this. We need to specialize people into different roles because the more specialized you are, the faster you are at, a com at, at doing something, right? Even at having a conversation. So often that's SMB, mid-market, corporate, just size of customer. It can be a direct conversation versus a partner team, a channel sales um, setup. Or um, at Xamarin, we um, started SMB mid-market, and then I actually had for at first an inside enterprise team that was talking to large accounts, kind of up to you know six-figure deals. But then we built a more traditional field enterprise team, people that were actually traveling or lo located in different locations. And that's where we actually started to think about verticalization pretty quickly because we were suddenly talking to people who were building two, three, four, five hundred internal enterprise applications. Yeah. And that's, you know, very, if you talk to an airline, um, you know, we had Alaska Airlines was one of our, you know, great early reference customers. And then we started to just have all the airline conversations suddenly. And it just was very helpful, again, for the customer to talk to an enterprise account exec that had just been through that entire journey with a very similar account that's in a very similar field. So at that point, it suddenly made it, and the same was oil and gas. Schlumberger was building 500 applications. That that has you know so many challenges for their head of digital or or their head of mobile, that they were super happy to talk to somebody who has been talking to other companies in oil and gas about exactly that. So it really depends on the stage the yeah. stage you're at. So just talking through our journey, and our journey is very similar to what I think New Relic went through um, segment. There's a bunch. It's in some ways it's easier to start off with like SMB and sort of frontline practitioners. Right, um, you're selling to people on a credit card. Like the barrier to entry is like a lot lower, um, and so a lot of companies start out like that's how you do a lot of your initial sales. Right, it's sort of like we're going to sell kind of mass market. That's also very hard, right? Um, it's very high calorie because you know you're, you're talking to thousands and thousands of like really small deals, and so you get to a point where it's like hard to keep the lights on. And so where the big money is is you know it's like hey I could sell to ten thousand of these guys or I could sell to one. You know you land one shark or whatever like multi million dollar deal, and you're like awesome. Um, and in building that into a repeatable pattern. Yeah. And so for us, we started with the small end. 
um, and it's still the bulk of our revenue, and then went upstream. Most of our upstream actually started off on the small end. And so that's the land and expand is the, hey, you know, we have pockets of people across Johnson & Johnson who are developing applications on our platform, then getting into the CIO, CTO, and having that kind of conversation, right? Or CFO, hey, we can save you money. We can help your organization become more effective. And by the way, you have these five teams throughout your organization. Here's how they're spending money. One of the things that was really eye-opening to me at Adobe, um, and I find the same thing at Salesforce, is quite often CIO, CTO, CFO, they, they don't know what their company's buying. Right? It's just like so disparate and people are putting things on credit cards and it's like marked as all different ways. And so that's a value as a sales organization you can bring to them to be like, by the way, your company's spending money on this. And we also know your company's spending money on that. If you consolidate all of that into, you know, sort of a, an ELA or like an agreement with us, we can actually save you money and make your team more efficient. So that's how we got into that. Um, now, um, as we built out that enterprise organization, now we're actually selling like direct to enterprise. So actual deals where it's like they didn't go through the, the self-starter at all. Mm -hmm. It's just basically going into an Eli Lilly and saying, hey, you guys are doing things this way. We think you should actually do it this way. And that's bottom up versus top bottom. So now we have kind of both. Both. Um, but we arrived at, you know, we, we worked our way up. And then once that became more of a thing and we had a team and emotion that we felt like made sense, then that's when we started attacking directly. I think it's hard to start top down it's, as a I startup. I think it's hard to start, yeah. Uh, and, and the reason is that a lot of top-down. I always, when I was running a business development organization, we'd go into partner with these giant companies, and the trick to partnering with a giant company is you have to get the individual people down at the bottom to really right. like your stuff, so that when you go and talk to the CIO or That's the right. CTO, and they say, huh, okay, this sounds interesting, I'm gonna go check with all my people and see if they're using it. Well, then what you've done is they go and they ask Bob in, That's right. in the basement, and Bob says, oh yeah, I love that company, it's really great. And now the, the CTO feels really good because he asked about something that his developers really love. No. And then the developer feels really good because the CTO now knows that like he already chose a thing that the CTO is going to use. Mm -hmm. and, and suddenly you have uh, the, the, the circle of good feeling going on. Um, when you start top down and you go into that CTO and you say, hey, you ought to buy New Relic, they're gonna go, why? I don't understand. Right. And you've got a long way to go and your brand better be very good. I think one of the reasons that Roku as part of Salesforce has, has penetrated the big enterprise companies is because of that Salesforce we brand. Have a bigger story behind us. Right, That's yeah, right. it's a massive story that, that matches the massive uh, directional movement of the CTO or the CIO at a big company. Yeah, it's um, one thing just to call out. So I've worked for a couple Fortune 500 CIOs and they tend to be really conservative. Right, just like the nature of their job and having to deal with like, I mean, you know, material finance systems, so many like ankle biters. And so if you're <laughs> an unknown quantity, it's almost impossible to try to go direct to enterprise. No, I, no, don't say no to the small <laughs> accounts. Um, but you do sometimes have to change how you operate with them. That's right, it's right? hard. You, you can't have a sales, eventually what will happen is you're, you're, you have a finite number of people that you can have for the amount of money that you're spending, right? And uh, I experienced this with customer success very, very painfully, where at New Relic, we layered in customer success after six years, right? We should have done it from day one, but yeah. it was long enough ago that nobody knew what customer success was. Mm -hmm. And so when we put it in place, I had three people for 14,000 customers. Well, <laughs> Those weren't busy people. <laughs> yeah, you can't do that, <laughs> right? So people. what we had to do is prioritize, and we said, fine, those three people just work the top 100 accounts, yeah. right? And then we slowly moved down, but as you move down that stack of customers, you had to automate more, mm -hmm. yep. right? And so it was just as valuable to have these small companies because, you know, for a long time, the small, the SMB was 60, 70% of New Relic's revenue. Right? It took 10, 12 years before New Relic flipped and became more of an enterprise company than an SMB company. Um, you have to keep those. Plus, every one of those people Market. has a day job yeah. with a big company. You have to think that way. And it's a marketing brand awareness thing to have those small companies. So don't, don't let them go. Just start, as Stephanie said before, start hiring people and specializing the people who have the skills to deal with the big, complex customers and how they buy and how you expand within those organizations and let the, you know, have a more defined, shorter 
sales motion to close the business or even an automated sales motion to close the business where it's a much simpler sales cycle. Yep. And, and I think there's a lot of infrastructure and tools that can help with that. So I think um, you can kind of build an SMB and mid-market sales motion that involve, evolve that and add on like a more enterprise go-to-market and become really smart between, you know, you know, Salesforce, Marketo, and Fur. You you can build, you know, AI-based tools that now. You know, add e even more to that, where there's a lot of information, a lot of conversation with the customer, and then maybe a you know junior team of really just college grads that you know can be super helpful and close a lot of business that way. Um, whereas obviously on the on the side of you know an enterprise buyer, you need probably more expensive, more experienced uh, person to handle to handle those conversations. Um, it didn't have, a, uh, what became of them had little to do with the bonus structure. Uh, had everything to do with what their, um, what their skill level was and their potential skill level and how fast the company needed a different skill, right? Um, lots of our early salespeople in, uh, at New Relic and at Century didn't, That's right. didn't become the enterprise account rep because it's just a, it's a different personality type, different incentives, different ways of operating. I'm sure you guys are going to encounter that, not just with salespeople. Yeah, I mean, as your companies grow, you're going to encounter yeah. that with every role, that the people that get you through each segment, like not all of them are the right people for the next. That's right. And a lot of people self-opt out, right? They say, hey, I'm like a 10-person company person. I'm not a 20-person company. Like, oh, 20 persons too big for me, or 50 persons too big for me. Or they just start maxing out. They start maxing and, and out. And you see their productivity out. doesn't grow with the need. Um, the, everybody loved the team bonus for a long time. Uh, eventually we got to the point where somebody raised their hand and said, you know, I just had a really massive quarter and I don't know that I like Sarah over here riding my coattails. And so that was the moment where we said, oh, okay, we're getting to the point where this is repeatable enough and where the morale of the team will be impacted by having a team bonus instead of starting to break it out yeah. and, and getting people into real salesperson mode. Um, so that's... And, and and, and I think, so at, at Xamarin, we did the, the whole team is on a team bonus only in the very early days. Mm -hmm. And then pretty quickly, we, we moved it to individual quota for the base target, but then a team bonus on the stretch target. And we kept that, honestly, until the acquisition. And that was such an amazing element that made it fun. And, and mm -hmm. I, I would see, you know, the, the super experienced enterprise account exec Sitting, you know, with with a new hire who had just graduated, and you know, explaining him, you know, his, you know, t you know, tricks on like how he's how he's working in the accounts. Um, so I think that can work really well and create this feeling of togetherness. I think you need a um, a quality of the whole team to a certain degree to make it work. Um, mm -hmm. I always like to look like the word earnest. I think that's almost like an old-fashioned term that nobody uses anymore. But it's like kind of people who do the right thing, even if nobody's looking. Yeah. Um, and I felt we had just a fantastic group of people, almost no turnover, by the way, throughout the, the entire years. And that made us very strong because it was a very f a feeling of togetherness and a team that really tried, tried to make it happen. And I think those very early hires, if you can figure out a way to keep them. If you can figure out you know, different roles that they can grow into or different activities that they can help with, there's so much knowledge and so much, um, even just emotion, if you are with a startup in the early days, that I think those can be some of your strongest um, contributors and a really, really you know, strong foundation for the, for the organization. Yeah. Don't yeah. underestimate the power of incentives to yep. drive teamwork. If you set the right incentives, uh, people will join together to meet those incentives. Right. And you can blend, by the way, individual quotas and team quotas and <laughs> yeah, play or around spiffs. with it and see what drives behavior in your company. Yeah, I mean, definitely, you know, you could have team quota, individual quota, you have spiffs, and there's like other incentive programs, like um, you get your individual quota, but if the team all hits their goal, we go to Napa. Or what, you know, like things like that. Or we all go to, you know, a, a bar. And you could be surprised at how cheap things can be but still motivating at times you know starbucks gift cards all it's just like oh but i won you know and again it goes back to like the competitive nature of a lot of salespeople. it's like we won something you know even if it's like a five dollar starbucks card sometimes it goes a long way and ways. i think sometimes it's even more the recognition yep. than you know a, do a dollar right. amount it's <laughs> more right. like you know because it's it's fun to kind of feel That's like right. you did something good and um you know and, and i remember people were making like movie posters about some of the people at every given month, you know, that were doing really well. And oh that, yeah. was, that was not even something that I told anybody to do. It just 
kept happening and it was just awesome you know yeah. you had like you know kelly up now on the wall with yeah. like some yeah. kind of so that's you know it's just fun to be recognized and rewarded for what you do every day um and often that's almost not that much um tied to the the dollar yeah. amount hopefully you know m most sales pr people in silicon valley can hopefully pay well, well any their parting rent. thoughts <laughs> for these guys for er early early stage companies, early stage founders. So um, I thought about this because we obviously emailed earlier today. And I think it's, it's two things. So first of all, really m force yourself to put yourself in your customer's shoes um, and make sure that you do everything from their perspective. If we talk about land and expand, funnily enough, that's actually our point of view. So it doesn't help the customer at all. So think about what land and expand means for the customer. For Zyman, that was you know, build your first app, that's our land, and then expand, we bring in, we help more teams. So yep. figure out what that is from the customer's perspective. So really care about the customer and do everything you can so they love you. Hopefully you have a great product, but your interaction, you know, they that's love right. you. But then on top of that, layer a very systematic sales process. Those two things are not um, contradictory. You know, the most important thing you sell is the fact that you care, but at the same time, really maximize every interaction. Um, and, and there can be, you know, like a seamless combination of the two. It, 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 it totally can be done. Bill? I would say a um, couple things. One is that whatever you're doing now, whatever you're doing in a month, whatever you're doing in three months, it's going to change. <laughs> yep. So be adaptable, right? Your customers change, your product grows and changes. The market changes. The market changes around you. The way people perceive your company will change. There is all, you can never say, finally, we figured it out and I'm out, right? It, it will change and you will have to continually adapt. So be flexible. If something is working, watch for it to start not working and then tweak it, right? So to the, to the extent, or to Stephanie's point, right, that involves thinking like your customer thinks. How are they perceiving you? Um, the other thing I would say is, especially for technical founders, um, make a huge effort early, early, early to let everybody know in the company that they're all part of the sales team, yep. right? And that the That's sales key. team is not <laughs> a separate and distinct piece of your company from the engineering development product and product organization. If you can create a tight link between the two early, where feedback from the sales organization is being consumed by the engineering organization yep. to make the product better, where engineers are feeling like they are part of the sales process, even getting in front of customers with a salesperson there, um, you're going to create an amazing environment that people want to work in and some amazing teamwork that's going to accelerate your ability to sell Yeah, the thank product. you for bringing that up. Um, that is a really good point that, you know, sort of sales isn't just a sales function. Um, that's one of the magic things I feel at Heroku. Um, one of the things I really value about there that the engineers love being on sales calls. They love talking to customers. The product people love being on sales calls and talking to customers. Um, and so as a salesperson, it's made my life a lot easier, you know, when I could just connect like, hey, here's the Postgres guy. You could talk to him directly. Um, it's magical and it's one of the things that I think differentiates us from a lot of our competitors because like our customers love that they're just like oh yeah Heroku like I know that I can just go talk to the Postgres guy you know if I need to um, I mean there's a scalability concern you have to figure out how to like load balance that of course but you know building that where everybody feels like hey I could be part of a sales call and it's not like some scary weird thing that some other team does is super super important yep. so thank you for that so big round of applause for our, our um, <laughs> Bill and Stephanie